Hi, I'm Avery Melcher, and this is The Pricing on the Cake. Welcome to episode four of The Pricing on the Cake, the podcast that's all about pricing your business confidently and profitably. Today, I'm joined by Avery Melcher. Avery, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. You're very welcome. It's awesome to have you with us. Avery, tell us please a little bit about yourself and your business and what you're currently doing at the moment. Yeah, I have a whole career and background in copywriting and ghostwriting for marketers, um, chief executives of large companies. And I now own an SEO content agency and am an SEO educator for small business owners, teaching them how to apply these tactics that huge companies know about and small business owners don't always get or know because it's kind of behind a gatekeeper somewhere (laughs) and teach them how to get organic traffic and organic growth on their website to find their ideal customers online. Mm. That's awesome. I can imagine that for some people listening, they might think that it's almost impossible or impossible to be able to kind of implement the same strategies that those bigger companies are making. Is that always the case? Like can small businesses really implement those same kinds of strategies? What's been your experience there? Yeah, the answer is yes and no. Um, At the end of the day, SEO doesn't have to be hard. It shouldn't be hard and it isn't. So a reason why the large companies employ agencies or have someone on their team to do it is because it's just like any other channel in your business. You need to pay attention to it. You need to have a strategy for it and you need someone to execute on it, right? So that's how you would hire anyone in your business. When you get to the point where you can't run your Instagram anymore. You're gonna hire that out to a VA or someone. So in short, they can apply the same strategies, but you're gonna go about it differently because you don't have the marketing budget of a Nike or the you know huge <laughs> brands in the world that have, are, have just become household names and everyone knows. So we'll, what I work with and what I teach is I teach them those principles and what those companies are doing, but then show them exactly how to apply it to their business in a meaningful, impactful way that gets results sooner rather than later. Sure. Well, I can imagine that would be a really fulfilling thing too, to be able to see a small business implement those kinds of strategies and get those results as well. Yeah. And it's so amazing because a lot of people, one of the myths around SEO is that it's going to take a long time. I have people come to me, they're like, yeah, but you know, I'm, I'm just going to go over here and do this thing or worry about SEO later because I know it's a lot of work and it's going to take six to 12 months. And I have case studies of clients doubling their traffic in three months or less. Oh. And so, and it of course depends where your baseline is. If you're starting at zero, it's easy to double that number. But, um, <laughs> you know, that's the strategies that I put together is to make sure they start moving the needle right away. I am a small mm-hmm. business owner. I've worked in small businesses and with small businesses. And I've also worked in agencies with huge companies. And I know as a small business owner, every dollar needs to answer. (laughs) Every dollar spent needs to answer for itself and carry its own weight. We don't have room to be pouring money into something with no return. Yeah. I can imagine that um, the objections for something like SEO, you know, with, with all of those myths that are around in terms of like, it takes too long, it's such hard work, you know, it doesn't move the needle fast enough. You know, for small business owners who are thinking that way and have that mindset around SEO, that it's not as urgent and or important as all of the other stuff or all of the other marketing things you could be doing. How do you normally address that when people say those sorts of things? Yeah, I would say the first thing I do when looking at a business is really make sure they are set up for SEO because I do believe you can invest in it too soon. And only from the standpoint of knowing the unique challenges, again, of a small business owner. So if you're a solopreneur, you don't have a team, you're trying to do all of the things and you're losing sleep, Mm. I would say... Let's focus on, you know, if you're at the point where you're just launching, let's focus on getting some sales and getting some money in the bank so you can invest in these other marketing tactics. I don't want to see you spend your life savings um, on setting something up. And I even, I argue this across all channels and everything. I've even had people come to me before they even have a business or they've even done market research or had a test product out and said, here's my, here's my marketing strategy 
strategy and my business plan? Can you tell me if it's good? And I'm like, well, your customers are all sitting online. They're ready to tell you if it's good. Run some yeah. $10 Facebook ads, put up a survey in a Facebook group, put up an Instagram post, write a blog post, see what their response is before you start going really heavy into anything. So that's where I would start just from a business standpoint. But then when you do have money coming in and you have a real business in place, the sooner you can get started with SEO, the better, because it does, it does take some time to build. You know, I always look for low hanging fruit and to get those wins right away, but to get those really, really high value keywords, it is going to take some time. And so you want that working in the background. By the time someone comes to me and says, I needed this organic traffic six months ago, it's kind of a losing battle at that point. Yeah. So you need to be a little forward thinking. You can say, okay, I just did my launch and I ran that off of social media, email, and paid ads. But when I turn off all those faucets or stop putting money into the ad machine, like where is my business going to be? Yeah, definitely. I love what you mentioned before in terms of, you know, doing the market research and actually letting your customers tell you whether your product is good or not. I think that it's such a common thing for for solopreneurs in particular, you know, people just starting out, they're so excited. They have this idea. There's this product or service that they want to do. And they, uh, you know, do all the fun, really sexy things. They set up the website and the Facebook page and they design everything, get all the branding done. And it's all like beautiful. But at the end of the day, if your customers don't want it, don't need it, don't have a willingness to pay for it, you're not going to make any sales. And so I think that's, that's such an important point. When do you think a business is ready to invest in SEO? Because I heard you mention that they really should do it as soon as possible, as soon as they can really afford it. Are there any kind of telltale signs a business has that you know you would suggest might mean that they're ready to make that investment? Yeah, well, this is a podcast about pricing. So when I personally talk to my clients, I say, you know, you get what you pay for in SEO. Um, mm -hmm. I've had some come to me and say, oh, I want to spend $200. And I'm like, well, go ahead if that's what your budget is. And that's the person that you want to work with, but you're going to get what you pay for. You could potentially be putting your yes. website in, in danger. Where it gets dangerous is if you don't know anything about SEO and you're bringing mm -hmm. your baby, which is your business and putting it in the hands of someone. So the yeah. first thing I tell my customers and clients is you have to tell me if you're ready financially, but I always ask for a three month commitment up front. And I say, if you can't invest for three months, you know, if you were, it's, it's it's kind of like the stock market. If you invest for three months and have to be checking every single day and are feeling a little tight, maybe we need to save a little bit more for that channel because we can't just snap our fingers and make it happen. Aside from that, if you have a website or you have a plan in place to build a website, we could do SEO. It's even better to do SEO when you're building a website because we can write all the copy with that in mind. Yeah. We can build a site map. We can let the research kind of dictate what we should be putting on there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were talking about the market research. In a way, that's what keyword research is. And keyword research okay. is a fundamental part of SEO. And this happens all the time where a client tells me this is what my business is and I'll find something that's a synonym or maybe, you know, in the same realm, but not mm. exactly what the customer's pro or what the client's product is. And they're like, well, that's not our product. And I'm like, well, this is how your customers are talking about it online. Yes. And I have data to back it up. And so we should have a page on your website that addresses that and is optimized mm. for it. But then we, as marketers can do our job and spin that conversation yeah. point of view to say, hey, here's how you've been talking about it and here's what you think you need, but actually this is what it is. And that's how you move people down the funnel and start building relationships. So, I mean, even within that, I talked about market research, I talked about <laughs> content marketing <laughs> funnels. So I think if you're really working with a good SEO partner, they're gonna be thinking about all of those things. They're not yeah. just gonna be thinking about putting keywords on a page or building back yeah. links. Yeah. I think it's so important when, especially in B2B, you know, you understand not only your customers, but your customers' customers as well. And, you know, having that intuition around how their customers are going to be seeing their website or interpreting the words that you're using. It's all about perception, really. And I mean, that's what, that's what pricing is all about. It's about perceived value. I mean, if you are talking about your product or service in a certain way and it's 
just, it doesn't resonate with your customers. They don't understand what it means. It's not going to resonate with them and they're not going to want to buy it. They're not going to want to start that relationship with you, build that no like trust factor. Ah, it's such a fascinating topic that, and it's interesting as well, looking at the differences too, the differences between you know, because usually business owners, we're very, we're so confident. We're so, you know, we're so experienced in what we're skilled in and what we do. And we have our own ideas about what things mean and the jargon and the terms we use. But at the end of the day, it's all about how our customers see it as well. So I'd love to switch okay. over now to, to your business, um, Avery, if that's okay. And I'd love to ask about your journey. Like, you know, what made you start your business? How did you navigate the start of your business as well? <laughs> very in a very messy fashion um, <laughs> as we all do <laughs> but, yeah, yeah and I'm very much and this is I mean it's going to come full circle here of why I say like get started do the research because mm. I had people paying me to do work before I considered myself self-employed or an nice. entrepreneur you know, I didn't, it didn't really hit me until I had gotten out of college and I really wanted to work in an agency. I wanted to be a copywriter and I was looking for those jobs. And in the meantime, this is kind of when, I mean, freelancing has always been around, but it was really hitting me with social media becoming more of what it is. I think at that time, Instagram was only two or three years old. And so companies were trying to figure that out. And so I would, I went to every, Every marketing event there ever was, <laughs> I moved to San Diego in California and was like going everywhere, had made business cards for myself, was handing them out, had a resume and copy stacks of it in my car. And I was going to all these events and people would say, you know, like, you're really smart. You seem like you really know your stuff. I'm building a website and I just need help building the website. Can you help me with that? Or I just need some help with my social media. Can you help me with that? So I really kind of started basically if someone needed words, <laughs> I was <laughs> like, I can put my words there. And so over the years, like I've helped build email funnels and I've done social media and I've done websites, I've done newsletters, I've done press releases. And over the time, like, I didn't know how to do all of that right away. I literally yeah. let customers tell me what they wanted. And then I went and figured it out yeah. or hired someone to teach me or hired that person to execute on it. And I would manage the client relationship. And it was literally the client would come to me and say, my business partner just built another website. Can you write website copy? And it's yeah. like, well, I mean, as of today, yeah. no, but sure. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> yes, now that. figure out the details later. <laughs> right, right. Like, and you learn a lot along the way. And I had, I had learned some of it in school as well. I did take, I had a journalism focus, but I had mm -hmm. studied fashion. So I was a little bit of fish out of water. Um, and really it didn't hit me that it was a viable thing. I was just trying to survive. And mm -hmm. then when I did finally get the job offer at an agency that I wanted, it was actually less than what I was making freelancing. Wow. And so I was like, well, um, you know what? I haven't even been trying, like I, I've been trying to get jobs and had freelancing gigs put in my lap. I've never actually gone out and tried to get freelancing work. Yeah. And so for a couple of years, I was calling myself, you know, a freelancer, freelance writer, copywriter. Um, and then I got into the niche of ghostwriting for CMOs, mm -hmm. which are chief marketing officers of large companies, the Fortune 500 companies, the biggest names in the world. And I was ghostwriting for them and following these people around, leading panel discussions with CMOs and basically got a free marketing education. <laughs> um, nice. by, Excellent. You know, being able, you know, how often do you get to talk to, you know, the VP of marketing for the Home Depot or Princess yeah. Cruises or Pepsi and sit in the room with these people and just hear how they approach marketing. Nice. Um, and I got to be their ghostwriter and a part of that world for two or three years. And during that time was still always working with my own clients. And, you know, that definitely elevated the work and the way that I was approaching what I wanted to do with my own clients. At that point too, it's always just been a dream of mine to travel around the world. Yeah. A part of my love of writing and what I wanted to do was to be a travel blogger. Like that was just, mm -hmm. I would watch the travel shows. I would read oh. all the blogs and I was like, this is just, this is it. Even studying fashion, I wanted to travel around the world and like talk about street fashion. 
And so with all of these jobs that I had, of course, being a freelancer, I worked remotely. And so sometimes I'm a little slow. I don't get subtle hints. You have to slap me in the face with it. So, you know, about three or four years of freelancing, I was like, you know, why am I struggling to like, I have this thing in front of me. Why am I struggling to like make it in this world that I like yeah. still need to into when I have this thing in front of me. And it was a mindset shift of I can work remotely and go travel anywhere I want in the world. And I don't, I don't have to write about the places to do the thing. Um, and I, I felt like I had a couple of gaps missing to get to the point where I started scaling and moving from a freelancer. Mm. I don't think that I don't think that every freelancer is an entrepreneur necessarily. Like, so I wanted to move from freelancer, started doing more consulting and getting out of doing the work. And then I started hiring a team to actually help execute on the work. Sure. And that's where I feel like I kind of moved from freelancer to consultant to business owner slash entrepreneur. And to do that though, I recognized that I was very ill-equipped and just didn't even know where to look for answers or help. And I, again, started looking for jobs and did get a job at Neil Patel Digital, um, Neil Patel's agency in San Diego, and got to be a part of their, one of the first handful of people on the ground there and help them build up the teams and the SOP and the process. And I really learned what it takes to not just work in an agency, but build an agency. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's been very valuable. So over the last, I started building my own three years ago. Mm -hmm. And then about a year and a half ago, I started traveling full time. So nice. now it, it's never a linear, linear story because it wasn't a linear path. It's like, um, that's all right. know, like a ping pong ball. Yeah. Back <laughs> um, that's what makes life no interesting, better, isn't it? Yeah, there's no better way to tell the story, <laughs> but that's kind of how it is, how it was and how it is some days. Yeah. So that's kind of my story it was just quite literally like going to where people needed me the most yeah and then following that and also learning what I enjoyed doing because that is a big part so I moved away from social media I realized I didn't want to do that I've always considered myself like you know a writer a creative person and yeah sales copy and email for whatever reason just didn't stoke that creativity in me and so mm -hmm. I did move towards on page and web. And when I started learning about SEO about five years ago, I just loved that we could take something that's creative, like writing and storytelling and mix it with data and numbers yeah. and actually get business results. Um, because basically my whole background of saying I wanted to be a writer was a role that was kind kind of pushed to the side, like it was a creative mm. role or companies would be like, we have someone who's managing our blog yeah. or our social media, but they didn't really understand the value of it or how it could be leveraged. And without SEO, without a plan, there really is no value to it. Yeah. So yep. um, Absolutely. when that came along and I was able to up level, that changed everything for me. Mm. Awesome. Oh, gosh, that is an awesome story, Avery, honestly. And, and even though it's not linear, I think, I think the most interesting stories usually aren't linear. You know, they're full of so many interesting twists and turns and things that we don't expect. And I think the fact that you were so open to it and like you said, you went where people needed you, I think that's such a key thing. And then we can all learn a lot from that. Thank you so much for coming on to the show, Avery. If people want to get in contact with you, how can they do that? Yeah, it's just my web. My website is just my name, averymelcher.com. All of my services are there. And again, very transparent. My pricing is all on my website, included with all the deliverables that you'll get within each package. And um, I'm also Avery Melcher on Instagram and TikTok. Fantastic. Thanks again, Avery. And for everybody at home yep. listening or watching, please don't forget to like and subscribe and leave us a review. If you'd love to get in contact with Avery, please do. And I will see you on the next one. Bye-bye.